Happy Tuesday, everybody. It's Patch Day. The One Punch Man event is now live. A list of hero changes and as well, quality of life updates. General updates. There was a hidden change in Season 3 that was lost in the patch notes that they've been tuning still. Season 3 now has some adjustments made to the distance in which you hear enemy footsteps. They've continued to refine this change and have found a nice middle ground between where it was in Season 2 and where it was prior to today's patch. The weekly and daily changes challenges have been reworked a bit important for those of you looking to grind both the battle pass or currency they removed the one that was win 15 games total in either unranked or competitive and now instead have two separate ones to win 10 comp games and 15 in unranked more rewards for playing longer i think that's a good thing and reminds you to have a incentive to get out of the ranked pool if let's say you're getting a bit tilted or something like i do they removed the challenge that was win five games in arcade which a lot of people didn't like now instead, you can do it in Mystery Heroes, Free For All, Deathmatch, or Arcade. The Role Mastery Challenge is now win five games, each as two different roles in Quick Play or Competitive. Daily Challenges, Support Weapon Mastery, and Support Ability Mastery have both been reduced, but now there will be a new graphic updating you on your challenge progress on a match at the end of a round. The end of match scoreboard now will freeze a player's stats post-match, even if they leave the game early or as it's finishing, to the matchmaker, they say they've made improvements that should help reduce unranked queue times and increase competitive match quality. And that's a technical term for them. They deem match quality as if the matchmaker is correct or its likelihood of making a fair match, aka a 50% win rate match. My question always is, how do they know, other than getting repeated data over time, if that individual match was a win or a loss for the matchmaker's predictions? Obviously, maybe a blowout out with lots of stats on one side versus the other that should be pretty clear they fixed a bug where causing large parties to wait longer in queue than intended and the matchmaker will now prioritize putting parties together which have a similar delta between the highest and lowest rated player updates to the competitive mode there is now competitive mystery heroes yes you heard that right season one begins on march 14th I'm gonna just go ahead and predict something, okay? I think this will be the most successful alternate competitive queue they've ever done. Not because it's the most competitive, but because it's the least competitive and just so wacky that I think players are gonna at least try it. I wanna try it anyway, but maybe this is my bias as a flex player who plays, I don't know, 30 heroes or something to a okay level. I'm happy to get randomly swapped to anything. And I don't even play mystery heroes, but I'm coming for whatever titles and rewards they have for it. There's a competitive screen layout update. We have added buttons to the competitive play menu that will allow players to easily access the tier legend leaderboard and competitive progress screens and a top 500 leaderboard update. Players in the top 500 will now see an animated update of their current position on the leaderboard after each match. Onto the hero changes. Orisa's Terra Surge can now be interrupted by Hack. The devs say Terra Surge is a channeled ultimate which cannot be interrupted by most abilities as it gains the same effects as Fortify. While this makes sense for stuns, Sombra's Hacked Interrupt shouldn't be negated and now correctly cancels Terra Surge. Changes to Romatra's ultimate, Annihilation, using Annihilation while in Nemesis form refreshes your bonus armor. The devs say, players found that shifting out of Nemesis form before activating the Annihilation ultimate would fully reset Nemesis form's bonus armor. To smooth out the gameplay, it now resets the armor health automatically as part of the ultimate activation this sounds like a buff but actually it only is like a quality of life buff because before you would have to wait fully to deform back into staff mode and then pop the ultimate to get the armor again whereas before if you popped it in order to extend the ability if you didn't have the armor you wouldn't get it back so you don't really get the benefit of the transformation and now you can just chain them together and get the benefit as if you waited the whole time i suppose it's a bit of a opportunity improvement because you don't have to wait the whole duration to extend it out but i don't know that seems kind of niche for that to matter too much roadhog's chain hook cooldown now starts when the ability ends instead of the start so that means if you hook something from really far away the cooldown won't actually start until the animation finishes this is a change they toyed with a million times in overwatch one as well conversely though if you miss the hook the animation is really short like if you yeet it into a wall like i seem to always do the cooldown will start immediately and they did buff the cooldown significantly i'm nostradamus i predicted this exactly it goes to six seconds just like lots of the other tank cooldowns Pretty nasty buff 
for this ability now. Hog was underrated, I think. And now I've got question marks on where this buff will land him because this is his signature ability. Getting it frequently is pretty nuts. The devs say the chain hook cooldown beginning when the ability started instead of at the end caused some confusion when discussing the cooldown since once you see the timer, it appeared as a second shorter than the actual maximum cooldown. After fixing that, we're reducing the cooldown overall by an additional second to increase the frequency of Roadhog's team utility now that being pulled in by chain hook is less deadly. Wrecking Ball gets a general update where they added a hero-specific option relative aim sensitivity while rolling and added a hero-specific option relative gyro sensitivity while rolling, but that's only for Nintendo Switch. The Grappling Claw added a timeout indicator for grappling grappling claw located above the ability icon and minefield's arming time has been increased from one second to 1.25 remember that was the big buff they gave him in the season three patch the devs say there is now a hero control option for wrecking ball to set a separate aim sensitivity while transformed into a ball as players may want to aim his weapons in first person and move the claw camera in third person significantly differently. In addition, a visual indicator for grappling claw has been added to indicate its maximum duration before automatically detaching. So you won't have to guess how long you'll be able to tether on a spot. That's actually quite convenient. Changes to Zarya, the shared cooldown for part barrier and projected barrier has been reduced from 11 seconds to 10 seconds. The devs say a previous change decreased both barrier duration and increased the cooldown at the same time, lowering Zarya's effectiveness more than anticipated. This is a partial reversion to help level it out. Onto the damage heroes, Ash, Bob now prefers to shoot at enemy targets that Ash damages with her rifle. This is very similar to Torbjorn's turret. The devs say we want to enable Ash and Bob to easily assist one another more. Bob now prioritizes targets damaged by Ash's rifle, which may allow for more flexible ultimate placement. Bob is already one of the best ults in the game. Freaking nuts. It's like having an extra tank out there who has range damage that turrets you down. This is good in all matchups, but I think one that I specifically think it will definitely help is up against a character like Mercy or other very escapable characters, Tracer maybe, where while Bob is on the battlefield ready to shoot, just a bit of tickle damage, and remember Ash's weapon is hit scan, so I guess even a hip fire will work on this. It's almost like an RTS move to get your Bob to target the Mercy who's flying through the sky after you injure her. The devs explain that it will free up where you can put Bob, and I'd say prior to this change, it was best contesting the objective or in the enemy's backline, mostly so he would bypass the tank's defenses and shoot something meaningful or at least get some value contesting the cart. But now that he'll snipe with you, he won't get distracted by like a shield. So I think to their point, he'll be more effective actually playing at Ash's side more often, especially when flankers are on you. You can specifically target the one you need Bob to help you with to defend yourself a bit better in that ult stage of the fight, making Bob even better. Prior to this, I think he was more unreliable as a more defensive option, but now he can do that too, I think. Hanzo's lunge cooldown has been decreased from five seconds to four. The devs say Hanzo has high burst damage potential with storm bow and storm arrows and strong utility with sonic arrows, but still underperforms compared to other heroes in the same role. This change increases his survivability without directly improving his strengths. I think an unsung change about Hanzo in Overwatch 2 is the map design. Overwatch 1 maps were a lot more square, so there's way more positions where vertically climbing mattered, whereas there's a lot of long maps in Overwatch 2 where an ability like Sojourn Slide that sends her miles into the distance is way more effective, whereas Hanzo's Leap or Lunge doesn't really get you that far unless you're running up a wall or are already on high ground. So it never really feels like it does anything in the sequel, I feel. I think it's probably worse than Cassidy's role. At least he gets fortification when using that. Hey, did you remember that was a change? A lot of players forget. I sometimes too. Cassidy has a small fortification added onto him when he does a roll, so much so that you can survive a pulse bomb if you use it right. Maybe Hanzo needs a similar effect, since his mobility is a joke. I'm surprised to see May get a buff. Blizzard's ultimate cast time has been reduced from half a second to four tenths of a second. The devs say May's Blizzard ultimate cast time sometimes led to situations where the animation appeared to have been completed, but it was still additional time that it could get interrupted. 
This change will help mitigate that feeling without significantly reducing counterplay. I know what they mean on this. Launching May's ult with a D.Va nearby, it's actually eatable for longer than you think because it looks like you've released it and, well, the physical object has a bit of a delay. This is to compensate for that, but also just means you'll cast it a bit faster on a character that's already performing pretty well in Season 3. Far gets a very strange buff. Jump Jet movement is now influenced by directional inputs. The devs say, in addition to rapidly launching her upwards, Jump Jet used to always move Farah forward a small amount which made the ability feel less responsive when trying to move to the side or backwards. This change now enables a small amount of horizontal momentum in any direction. Ah, very small change, actually. It just means holding a movement direction, that little lean that Farah does when using Jump Jet, it doesn't only go forward now. But an important thing, and another one of these quality of life changes they seem to be doing this patch, Sojourn gets a massive nerf. Okay, finally the nerf that everyone's asked for. Just when I think Sojourn's like pretty balanced, actually. This is a hilariously thick nerf. Torso hit volume width increased by 20%. Oh my goodness. Devs say, due to the angle of Sojourn's torso in her default animation stance, her torso hit volume was more difficult to hit compared to similarly sized heroes. No kidding. Into those gorgeous ample thighs. <laughs> now her hitbox, I think, is more properly balanced and tuned to a character that definitely never skips leg day. Characters I think this matters to the most are ones that don't need headshots. So projectile characters like Genji when shooting a volley at close range to Sojourn is more likely to hit in any projectile for that matter, where you're normally aiming for the center of mass, that's just a bigger target, but also a hit scan like Soldier, who benefits from getting headshots, but often won't be going for those set shots like a Widow or Ash Might sniping off their head. Outside of GM anyway, for us mortals, Soldier and let's say Diva, Reaper, characters like that, spread damage weapons, Tracer as well, will find it easier to mow her down from the middle of mass. Onto the support category, Batiste's immortality field, minimum health threshold has been increased from 10% to 25%. Batiste is capable of potent damage and healing output, but often slightly underperforms across many skill levels. This change to the immortality field's minimum health threshold will strengthen his utility and enable him to more reliably assist his allies after its effect ends. Onto the bug fixes now. I'm not going to read all of them. There is a lot, but some of the ones that I was annoyed by. The game reports showing incomplete data should be fixed. Bug fixes and optimizations spread across a lot of the maps. Specifically, Midtown, they fixed an area where players were unintentionally able to stand. They're not specific about this, so I'm maybe guessing it might be a spot like on top of the train or another gap or ledge. They fixed a bug where Hanzo shooting someone with an arrow from the golden bow could turn their gun gold. And I'm sitting here wondering, why did they fix that? That sounds awesome. Nah, you gotta grind competitive if you wanna get that gold gun. Nothing for free in Blizzard land. And last thing to announce with a new patch that always means the replays are wiped. You guys sent in a lot in the previous form that I posted, and I got through a lot of them. Content from that will be coming this week, but there will be a new form linked in the description for you to submit your replay codes of games that you lost, but weren't sure why, or you thought you played really well, but lost anyway. Submit your replay codes to get featured on the channel by taking the link in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to leave it a like, and don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon to actually get notified when our videos come out. That's been it for me. I've been Frito for your Overwatch. I'll see you guys next time.